Today is September 1st, 2021, and my guest is author and journalist Sam Quinones. His latest book and the topic of today's episode is The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. Sam was last here in January of 2017 talking about opioids and heroin and his book Dreamland. I want to let parents know that today's episode will deal with adult themes, some of which you may want your children to hear, but you may not. That's up to you. Sam, welcome back to Econ Talk. Great to be here, Russ. Thanks so much. I love your podcast. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, I love your writing and your book. This is this is a very powerful book. Um, it you. is heartbreaking in many parts. It's incredibly informative. I learned some things that I'd been uh, puzzled about that really helped me understand some of the things that are going on in America. And it forms something of a trilogy with recent episodes with Johan Hari and Irina Hertz, and maybe as Sam, you yourself suggested, uh, Michael Easter. I hope to pull some of those themes together in, in talking today. I wanna to start with the magnitude of the drug overdose problem in the United States. Um, how, how serious is it? Oh, well, I think it's quite serious. Um, you know, we are hitting record, uh, record levels of overdose deaths. But that, and that is a, 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 a deep and profound tragedy that is uh, coast to coast. I would say that that's what differentiates this opioid epidemic from the one that we had in the 70s, which was really just a heroin uh, overdose. And that was very isolated with certain urban areas, really New York, LA, San Antonio, you know, um, pl places like that. This is far, far more widespread um, and um, grows from the opioid, the beginnings of the opioid epidemic, which starts with, of course, what we talked about in our last uh, conversation, which was uh, overprescribing, wanton prescribing really is what it was by doctors from coast to coast of narcotic opioid painkillers for pretty much all manner of um, variety of, of things and lots of refills and a huge, huge supply of of opioid painkillers unleashed unleashed on the country. This next book really deals with with what's going on uh, now, which is the, the underworld has taken over um, uh, uh, willingly, very eagerly, and their supply is also um, pretty much co coast to coast. And so you're seeing no longer seeing those isolated pockets that we saw during the heroin problem of say the 1970s. You're seeing it really in rural areas, suburban areas, urban areas in North Carolina, in Portland, Oregon, um, in Maine, in, in uh, Phoenix, in Los Angeles, you don't find that kind of separate kind of area. So pretty much every part of the country is, is, uh, is facing this with record death, but, but the, the overdose death is, is just really, uh, to hate to be a quote a cliche, but it's really kind of the tip of the iceberg. But beneath that is widespread, I would say, very damaging addiction and um, horrible costs placed on families, on schools and businesses, on um, county governments particularly. So you're seeing this as uh, really unlike any other, it seems to me, in just in the terms of, of, of how widespread it is and, and the death that it's caused. Um, I looked at the numbers, you know, obviously it's, it's not easy to measure it with any precision, but what I saw is that in 2020, uh, something like 93,000 Americans died of, of drug overdose, up from 70-something the year before. Some of this is a response to COVID and isolation, no doubt. Uh, but a lot of it is on the supply side, as you're talking about. Um, and it's really, the, as you point out, the addiction and the paralyzing effect of that on communities, human beings, families, and so on. Because, I mean, an overdose death, I assume, is not easy to count. Um, do you right. have any feel for that? No, I would say, I would say we're undercounting by perhaps anywhere from 20 to 30%. And one of the reasons for that is that we have across the country um, a very, very uneven um, system for counting and for um, tabulating, but, but describing as well um, uh, drug overdose deaths. Um, it could be e even among counties with lots of money you know, large city, county, large urban counties, even there you find doctors in the past anyway, have not really been able to 
um, get kind of put the get their heads together and find a com common um, a vocabulary, a common way of counting. Um, but then when you get out to the rural and smaller counties with much uh, weaker tax base, um, you are finding that m frequently counties don't have money to do all all the all the blood work, all the toxicology tests that uh, that every autopsy um, ought to have if there is a suspected uh, overdose. And I, so I think that that uh, because of all that and many other things we could talk about, but it has to do with really a kind of a creakiness, an underfunded way of of dealing with with uh, death investigations in this country. That probably means that we're undercounting by uh, twenty to thirty percent, something like that. The part that's, I think, hard for people who are not drug users to understand, though, is how does an overdose happen? Is it a mistake? Is it somebody who is has been increasing their dosage because the high isn't what it used to be? Is it a suicide attempt? That, that uh, it worked? could be all of those. It could be um, that they are, are getting dope that doesn't um, – that they don't know the, the, the potency of, which is a, a very common – um, you know, uh, 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 most most addicts, I would say, don't mean to die necessarily. It's not a suicide, although some certainly certainly are. But the problem is, you know, once you get to a point where you're addicted, it, there is a, 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 a wide bit of caution that you throw to the wind. And so at the moment of wanting to shoot up, it doesn't really that is not really top of mind, I would say. And, uh, and what you're actually shooting up or what you're smoking sometimes too. Now it's so potent, the dope is so, so potent nowadays that you can actually don't have to shoot it up. You can smoke it, you can still overdose because you're, you're, you're in the middle of this idea, gotta get, gotta get high, gotta postpone, gotta put off those, those withdrawals, that sickness and so on. And, and so it could be, could be all, all, all of that. Let's, let's start with um, fentanyl. Uh, first tell us, What's fabulous about it, because it, it has some wonderful applications oh, yeah. in surgery. Um, and and I have to say, and, and then talk about how it became a drug of choice and then a drug that got introduced into other drugs, which is, it's incredibly potent. Yeah. Very, very, very small amounts of it are, can be fatal. And, and try to answer the question, which I, I thought about, which I don't think you talk in the book about, it seems like everybody should die from this who's using it. I mean, it's so, it seems so dangerous. So talk about the right. good side and then some of the, the downside and, and, and what determines how, how dangerous it is. Right. A fentanyl revolutionized uh, surgery. It's not an exaggeration uh, to say that. It was invented by one of the great scientific minds of the 20th century, in my opinion, Paul Janssen, Belgian man who, who invented in nu numerous uh, drugs and that, all, that have helped all of us. Uh, I had a heart attack uh, four years ago, um, and I uh, they they gave me fentanyl. I'm very very happy that that they did. It's a magnificent dr drug for surgery because it very quickly it's it, it very quickly enters the brain. That's the key to it. Unlike morphine, even heroin, which takes us a, a good deal longer, fentanyl very quickly enters the brain. But it also uh, it's easy to it it it, it it's it's its effects are are, are short. So for surgery, that's perfect. You don't you you can bring somebody into anesthesia very quickly, um, do the operation, and take them out with almost no effect. And so it really transformed surgery. It allowed for all kinds of surgery in a, in a much safer uh, environment. It's actually a much safer drug in the surgical uh, um, uh, context than, than, than many of the things that they were using back in uh, before fentanyl was invented, which was in 19, 1960. However, as Paul Jansen well understood and many others have well understood it because it enters the brain so quickly, because it attaches to our, our, our brain receptors, the opioid brain receptors so quickly, it, it is, that's what makes it, that's what it's, uh, it makes it potent. That it, it is, is a very quick acting and very powerful powerful um, um, uh, 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 drug. And if used incorrectly, it can very quickly kill people. In a matter of seconds, you drop off. In a matter of perhaps a minute or two, you're, you're dead. Whereas in, in uh, heroin overdoses, this takes minutes, perhaps 15, 20 minutes, it's possible to, to, uh, for that to take effect. With fentanyl, it's much quicker. Um, you know, people are found dead kind of with their you know, heads on their on their laps on a toilet or or having collapsed, they don't have time to react. Their head hits the hits the floor like that. Um, now, uh, so fentanyl was really 
um, uh, a surgical uh, a tool for many years. On occasion, there were cases of rogue chemists out there in, in the United States who figured out that they could make this and sell it. And you see little outbreaks, occasional outbreaks in the 80s and 90s. Um, and no one quite knows who they are. A couple of times these guys are arrested, but it does not really find its way into the, the enormous un drug underworld until about beginning in 2006, a case I talk about in, in the book, in which, um, which, is the t which is the case in which the Mexican drug trafficking world discovers fentanyl for the first time. Uh, a chemist down in the, st in the, in the town of Toluca, uh, uh, Mexico, which is outside Mexico City, an industrial town, uh, puts together a lab with funding from apparently the Sinaloa drug cartel and Chapo Guzman and all those folks, and puts together a lab in which he makes kilos of fentanyl. Um, he discovers through testing that on mice that uh, this fentanyl has to be cut 50 to one. So one kilo will make 50 kilos. Now in the drug world, no one believed that. No one thought that was remotely possible. He did, but everybody else didn't. So they begin to sell it as if that's a, that's a joke, that's a lie, that someone is trying to sell me my this fentanyl, this drug, when I know that no, no opioid on the street can be cut 50 to one. And be too watered down. It wouldn't have any. Effect. There's no point in selling it. No one would buy. It. Yes, exactly. Word word would spread, and 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 no one would no one would buy this stuff. So they begin to sell it far less adulterated, and it begins to kill uh, hundreds and thousands of people uh, in the year 2005 and six. Um, in first in Chicago, where the where the dope first goes, but then also St. Louis, Detroit, then it goes east with uh, street gangs that are selling it to um, Philly and Camden and variety of other towns. And within a period of about a year, there's you know many thousands of people die. It's this big, big loop of a, of a, of a death curve. And then they bust it in uh, 2000, April of 2006. They take uh, this fellow to prison. He's, he spends uh, 15 years in prison. He's now out somewhere. I'm not really sure where he went. Um, but it was a, it, with that, fentanyl kind of died off. And so there wasn't really, you, you saw the importance of supply reduction with that one case. Death, and then when the thing is busted, no more, no more death. Um, but you know, this, the 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 traffickers in Mexico were in the were in the were in the process of discovering our new enormous opioid addicted market due to the widespread proliferation of these of these narcotic painkillers, and in time, it was only a matter of time before they figured out we just need to mass produce or find 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 resources uh, of where we can buy mass quantities of of this stuff. Fentanyl. They first found it in China, and you would see this mainly a, a beginning in about 2014, 15. Right in there, they begin to buy fentanyl directly from many, many chemical companies in in China, and 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 they begin to then. They, but then they learn to make it. And when China eventually curtails its fentanyl, its companies from selling fentanyl and cracks down on that in about 2000, I think 19, you begin to see the Mexican drug world. Uh, produce this stuff. The benefits of fentanyl are, as you know, basically what they've done is they've taken a supply chain that is very, very populated, lots of people involved, and very costly, and they just merely cut the cost out of the supply chain. Fentanyl is made much easier than than heroin. You don't have farms to worry about, sunlight, irrigation, land. It's just a chemical in a lab with some folks who know how to make it, and then you, you send it north. And so it's it's part of this kind of increasing kind of corporatization almost, uh, the sophistication of the trafficking world down there, that they have figured out that this is this is far, far more profitable, easier, far less risk, and 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 far easier uh, to 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 get it to the United States, and is a, is a perfect substitute um, for heroin. Heroin market and and opium poppy market in in Mexico is now, frankly, in depression. There's no there's no market for it anymore because of fentanyl. So, and you also talk about how other drugs get laced with fentanyl as a way to jazz them up, give a bigger hit. But why doesn't it kill more people? I mean, are they that good at Obviously, you don't want to kill your customers. Again, to take a purely no, profit-driven no, no perspective in, yes. on this, no individual trafficker or dealer really 
wants to do that. But but I think what's happened is that there is a wild west market down in Mexico that has taken taken hold. And and what I mean by that is once one person figures out, you know, it's not that hard to make your own fentanyl or first to buy it from China, but now to make your own is very easy. All you have to have is is ample access to world chemical markets and the trafficking world, certainly on the western side of Mexico, has has that through two very large ports on the Pacific coast in the town of, uh, first in the town of Lazaro Cárdenas in Michoacán, and the other one is in Manzanillo in Colima. Well, they control a lot of the chemicals that go through there. They can make all the, all the stuff that they, that, they, that they want. And what ends up happening is the people who are selling those chemicals don't want to sell it to as many people as possible. The people who are, who are making this stuff are different from the folks, by and large, who are, who are bringing it, the chemicals in. They don't care. They want to make stuff to make money. They don't really care where it ends up. They don't care how it's used. Um, in fact, I would say there's a like a fervent competition among them to make that sure. stuff and get it out. And when the, all that stuff is not regulated, it's it's there's no oversight. And and you don't. And also, you are removed as a producer two or three levels at least from the person who's from later the selling it on on the street. But let's go back to that the dilution part of it, a, a dealer in the United States, well, well, give me the supply chain. You've got the chemist manufacturer you've got the, in, say, you've in got Mexico. The lab, the lab in Mexico, which may or may not have a chemist, probably one time had a chemist showing them how to but do now, it, yeah. but maybe some trained assistant or what have you. But it, you, produces, you some, st- it produces some amount, right. and that amount gets smuggled across the border right. in, in its raw form? At that point? Well, now we're, yes, let's just say in, 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 there's two ways. There's, it, it can be s- several ways, but, but in its raw form, just like a brick of fentanyl, like a kilo of straight mm-hmm. fentanyl, it's then um, probably not opened until it gets to the destination. Let's say, just say Chicago or Indianapolis or uh, Nashville, where I'm living uh, right now, or Los Angeles. And there it's broken up into smaller pa- packets and then sold to dealers who then probably there's maybe another level down who are selling it to the street street level dealers it's unclear to me uh, and i don't i don't think you can actually know this who is actually um, uh, adulterating who is actually putting fentanyl in whatever is eventually uh, sold it could be the 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 one, the street level could be one level up maybe two levels up it's it's it hasn't this changes radically but what isn't clear is what you need how much you need to um adulterate it and this is often this this is often uh you, you're error. told oh this will take a five to one hit meaning you can make five kilos out of this one one kilo um it's possible that that's the case but you're taking the word of someone you don't trust and don't know and who has no reason to tell you the truth most of the time and so so you get, and then you get to the point where it's actually mixed. And that's also where a big, big problem go, comes because most of the people who are doing it are addicted to something, money or dope, or, and they are not pharmaceutical companies who, who study how to properly mix this stuff and write PhDs on it and that kind of thing, you know? So you get these guys who are just mixing it sometimes in their kitchen in their basement, in their bathroom. Uh, one chapter, as you know, in the book talks about how early on a lot of guys were using magic bullet blenders. You can buy these at Target for $29.95. The magic bullet was, was um, kind of spread. The underworld really relies a lot on mythologies that spread rumors. You know, this is the best thing to use. You should use this magic bullet. One of the benefits, perceived benefits of magic bullet blenders was it's in that little plastic dome. So you're not going to be inhaling the stuff as you would if you mixed it in a bowl. I guess that's a, that is a benefit. The problem is you can't mix powders with a blade. A blade mixes the powders right around the blade. You have to, in order to mix well with the blade, it has to be liquid. But most of those guys were were just mixing, and they they thought they were doing a good job. But what they were doing was really creating a a potent mix in which part of the mix was absolutely without Pure. fentanyl, and other parts yeah. were deadly to almost anybody who would use it, even those who've been who've developed a high tolerance. But just to be clear, uh, in that kilo, 
my guess is that if you put your finger in it and licked it, it, it would kill you. Is that correct? It's, it's, very, it's almost entirely fentanyl. Yeah, it's a very high amount of fentanyl initially. Now, you, you do see some variations. Obviously, this is the underworld, all kinds of possibilities there. You could see uh, half the kilo is fentanyl, half the kilo is some kind of cut. Um, yeah. but, but I think by and large, what they're sending up with one kilo of fentanyl is just straight ki a kilo of fentanyl because you don't want, if you're going to make the same amount, you'd rather just send one kilo of fentanyl rather than, than two. It's more, it's more, it's bulkier, you know. And, and you want to have a relationship. You say, you know, trust the person, but ideally it's an economic transaction. There's no brand names are tough, but you do want repeat business. And so you want to have that person sell that to their customers down the supply chain and eventually sure. come back and buy more. That, uh, that's presumably the, the idea, but now you know the problem. It, it, the, the producer really almost has no connection whatsoever down in Mexico with the guy who's actually selling the stuff. Um, and maybe no. the last two levels before it There's hits middle the people. Street. There's middle people. It's just uh, like connections that are mid-level and it's unclear it, how often people actually know what precisely it's true. Uh, they're selling. Again, this is, the, this is the underworld. It's a wild west economic free market, you know, where just yep. everyone's selling and buying whatever they can get. And that is also where, where the, uh, the reason for adding fentanyl now to other drugs, almost like we add salt to food to kind of give it a boost. Um, fentanyl is now, they've discovered, being added to Primarily, I would say methamphetamine and cocaine. Occasionally, I've heard reports of marijuana. I don't think that's too common yet. Who knows? Maybe later. But certainly methamphetamine and cocaine. Um, and, and, and there's a few reasons why you might do that. In the case of cocaine, comes from Colombia, um, you, you need something to boost it because by the time it hits you, gets to you, the dealer on the street, it's probably passed through four or five hands and it's probably been cut a few times. So it's going to be a little diluted. So you need something to boost. But the buyers of cocaine and methamphetamine, because those drugs don't have the same kind of withdrawals that opioids have, they, the buyers of those things are not daily, desperate, almost religiously daily buyers of this, of this stuff, right? Um, so they're, they're occasional users, I'll buy it for the weekend or what kind of thing. If you add fentanyl to the mix, what you eventually are going to get is an opioid addicted customer, addicted almost as if it were a heroin addict. And that customer is going to buy from you every single day, maybe sometimes more than once, once a day. And that is the other benefit. People understand this very well on the street now, and they, they know what they're doing. And um, there is that boost that they give the drugs. Sometimes they charge more. I talked to a woman whose boyfriend sold meth um, laced with fentanyl, and he charged double. So his meth without fentanyl was one price. His meth with fentanyl was twice that. So it's it's a, it's you know it, it and it and it's different in in every region because we're not talking about a corporation here. We're not talking about you know the McDonald's. same rules applying to everybody. Well, let's talk about meth. Um, I this was the single most fascinating piece of the book for me. Uh, so talk about meth generally, and then talk about its relationship to the homeless encampments uh, that are. Now, I won't say they're common around America, but they're not rare. Uh, yeah. I noticed this maybe, I don't know, a few years ago, not not many, in the last five. I you know, took a trip to Seattle, and there's like a camping. It looks like a camping uh, right. project. There, there's 10, 20, 30 tents uh, on an exit from the uh, interstate. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's weird. That's homeless people, evidently, but they're not outside. They're intense. I thought that's, you know, it's become sort of an accepted thing. Then I was in San Francisco a year or two ago, and there's tents on the sidewalk. It's not right. like there's one. There's there's many. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I have incorrectly, I would say after I read your book, I know it's incorrect. I had sort of attributed most of this. It's part of it, but most of it to an increased tolerance by city governments in certain locales like San Francisco and Seattle for, for homeless people who often have uh, psychiatric issues and that, you know, they don't want to be part of the the safety net or the, the county services or the or city services. And so there, there's something I – mean, uh, it's hard to say it. I, I, I'll come back and talk about this later. But let's just 
tell me what meth has to do with that because who right. who knew well, well it's crazy know, uh, yes it, it absolutely is and, and the, the fullness of the story didn't occur to me till i was very close to finishing the book but the, you know the mexican trafficking world has always been earth land based plant based that's because most of those folks became from the little ranchos, the little villages. They were very, they were already farmers. And so they grew into drug trafficking through marijuana and secondarily through opium poppies. You know, that was really, well, they, they learned or their children, maybe even their grandchildren learned of the, the third generation of traffickers, the second and third generation learned that, you know, all of that is a waste of time. Again, as I was saying earlier, why have land? Why have uh, irrigation? Why have uh, farming and all that stuff when you can just- Weather. <laughs> yeah, why rely on the seasons, right? You've got ways of making drugs and the first drug, now fentanyl uh, reinforced that idea, but really the first drug they learned that with was methamphetamine. The Mexican trafficking world on the Western side of Mexico uh, figured out, perfected, industrialized methamphetamine production beginning in the late 1980s. They had labs both in California then and in, and in Mexico. Uh, as the 90s progressed into the 2000s, law enforcement in the United States got very aggressive and began curtailing uh, easy, uh, easy ability to make the stuff. So uh, by, by the mid 2000s, all those labs are going south, but they made methamphetamine uh, very, very well, very expertly. And they did so because it was very easy to do. And they made it from one specific chemical. The chemical is known as ephedrine. It's, a, it's antihistamine. You find it in Sudafed tablets and all that. And, and that's why that's why Sudafed became a yeah. sp something that used to just buy off the shelf, and all of a sudden right. it's behind the counter. You got to sign for it. You got to it's being regulated not regulated so much as monitored your usage of it. But that's the reason. Precisely, and you'd go you see guys go to Walmart or Costco and come away with boxes of bo boxes of little boxes of Sudafed pills because they want to extract the the ephedrine. In the Mexican world, they were able to get it on the world chemical markets. They were also able to get tons and tons of pills they could extract it that way but they may ephedrine had a benefit in that it was very easy to make it so if you didn't know anything about chemistry you could do it anyway and number two you could find it easily on the market and so all you had to really do was tweak the ephedrine molecule a little bit and it became methamphetamine and that's what they did and the the, the issue that they always had though was that if they could not get enough ephedrine to to properly kind of i guess cover the entire uh, United States. The meth that they made was a lot because there was hundreds of tons of ephedrine legally available in Mexico every year, but that was really only enough to cover the Western United States and even not all, all, all of that. And so you found in other areas, particularly like the Midwest, people going, as you said, um, and getting Sudafed pills and through a complicated method, extracting the, the, the ephedrine and making maybe a few grams or at the most maybe a couple ounces of this stuff you're not seeing enormous enormous supplies come from this from this stuff and so meth became part of american culture in a way that it probably hadn't been by the 19 1990s you began to see those those mugshot posters where you'd see one person over a six to eight year period kind of mugshots of, of that person six to eight years through and you see that person excuse me kind of decline and decay, you know, and after by the eighth, sixth year, you pock marks and wild looks and disheveled. And that's the, the effect of methamphetamine over a six year period. But then the meth changed. And that's what we are dealing with today. The change really came because finally Mexico, uh, not sure if this is the wisest step, but nevertheless, Mexico made ephedrine completely illegal, except for a few licensed pharmaceutical companies to possess. And that in the midst of, of, of this bonanza of meth production that the, the Mexican traffickers are in the middle of, of, of realizing and these concentrations of real skill and technical innovative um, um, ability in certain parts of Mexico, all of a sudden it throws them into kind of this new moment where they have to say, dang, we were making tons of money with this all year round because there's no seasons when it comes to laboratory drugs. And then all of a sudden, so, so now they have to find a new way. Well, it turns out there is an, another way of making methamphetamine. It was a way practiced by California Hells Angels and biker gangs that used to control it back in the 1960s. It's very messy. It stinks. 
and 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 it it leaves a um um and it requires I should say um a whole bunch of 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 chemicals to do what ephedrine before was just doing and it it relies on the pre precursor known as p2p phenol to propanone p2p it can be made though they had one benefit the benefit was this the only benefit that this had was this and that is that you can make p2p with so many different chemical packs different ways so you can't stop the the really hard to stop the flow you cannot regulate it the way you could you could, if you have one only one chemical that's kind of like the bottleneck government can regulate that pay close close attention to it and 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 basically you have a difficulty going going forward with it you, and and that's what happened with 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 ephedrine with this stuff if they if you use one way to make p2p and they crack down on some of those chemicals well you can find another and it, it turns out according to organic chemists and dea chemists i've spoken with that there's really almost not to say there's no end to the numbers of ways you can make p2p but there are many many ways and they all use very common chemicals chemicals that are common in the industrial world you know and in legal industrial processes these chemicals turn out to be extraordinarily toxic many of them lie cyanide sulfuric acid hydrochloric acid there are many that's just a few there are many that are occasionally used for all these things the benefit of the, of this new method is that that um you know to the supplier <laughs> as the supply, to the supply, well always this is the benefit to the supplier they 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 if you if you have control of ports which they do in Mexico those two ports on the Pacific coast and Lazaro Cárdenas and Manzanillo you can get access to the world chemical markets and import that stuff by the ton and nobody can really stop it and by but certainly governments can't regulate it and that's what began to happen after the Mexican government made ephedrine um more than just regulate and really made it illegal except for in a few few cases the 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 the, the supplies dried up and all of a sudden the trafficking world had to shift and 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 but they had control of these ports so they begin to bring in these other chemicals and beginning in about 2009 10 11 12 you begin to see the expansion of the p2p meth method of making um methamphetamine along the way a couple of key figures are killed uh one guy Nacho Coronel who was basically the meth lord of Mexico was shot to death by military Mexican military in 2010 another guy a kind of a, a local guy in Sinaloa who was very important in bringing in ephedrine for a long time from all over the world he is murdered um and with that though again you see this explosion you just all the controls that these men may have exerted in one form or another are gone and pretty soon what you begin to see is just an explosion of people making methamphetamine because they can because and all year all year round because they can they can get access to those chemicals they don't rely on seasons and so you begin to see the the supply begin to just just explode and it's a it's a remarkable uh thing to watch so this innovation of an alternative production process for meth comes with a terrible price uh for users and yep. um mental um Initially, Mental you know, response. what I thought was, my story was, initially what I thought was, this is amazing. This is a, a you know, they are behaving like any consumer product corporation sure. now. They, they, they can make it year round, just like Oreo cookies or whatever. Um, they can, they can, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a whole new evolution and the supply is staggering. And you can take advantage of economies of scale. You can build... Sure not just a guy in a, in a basement, you can build an enormous warehouse and you describe a number of them that are really extraordinary, uh, frightening. Exactly. And, and, and what you also have, that's, that is, and if, if you control the ports and of course, crucially, if you control law enforcement, and that is the, the size of those labs and the permanency of those labs is really just a testament to the fact that these guys are operating with impunity. They have all the guns they need from the United States they have law enforcement in their pocket. They have pol politicians frequently uh, on their side in some, some clandestine way or another. And so they begin to supply. And so initially, I thought this was a, uh, just a story about the enormity of the supply and the prices dropping to, to you know, in Kentucky, 
where they before were doing that 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 uh, uh, Sudafil pill reduction method known as shake and bake is what they used to call it. Now that's gone. All of that is just gone. All those little suppliers like what Walmart did to Main Street in America, that's what Mexican meth does to all those small suppliers and it's pretty much all Mexican meth now. Then I came upon, I was about to finish the book. I was closing in on finishing the book when I realized that there was another story that was, I think, even bigger than the one I was working on when it comes to methamphetamine, this new P2P method of making it. And that is that the P2P meth, unlike the ephedrine meth, was creating uh, symptoms of schizophrenia as it passed across uh, the country among everyone who, who used it. Uh, ephedrine meth was like a party drug. It took six or seven years for you to decay to the point where your picture would be all pocked and everything like that on those posters. It was a party drug. You could normally kind of more or less hang on to your life. You had a house, you had a job. I knew many people who did this. It was very big in the gay community because it was this party drug and this kind of thing. If um, P2P meth was nothing like that. It was a very sinister drug. It brought you inside. You didn't want to be around other people. You wanted to just kind of be alone with whatever bizarre thoughts your mind was now cooking up and conspiracies. You you began to um, not want to be around people. You not you began to um, speak babbling, what they call word salad in, in, in psychology. It began to create mental illness as it marched across the country, um, beginning in the western side, of course, all the way to now Vermont and, and New Hampshire, which never had any meth of any kind really to speak of ever, now it's got, now it's got a very serious um, meth problem. One of the challenges, and we'll get to the homeless part of this in a second, yeah. but sure. I, I, the part I, I was puzzled by as I was reading this, and it, it, it's horrifying, and um, in this conversation so far, uh, Sam is, and I are talking about the chemical process and so on, but the book itself is filled with the human tragedy alongside these kind of, um, what I think of as, as market-based uh, phenomena. It's, yeah. Markets are really good at giving people what they want. Uh, a lot of people want this, and the other side finds ways to make it more cheaply. The incentives are there, and that's what we're talking about. The puzzle for me is that this this more sinister version of meth, which you describe, again, I, we're not going to be able to do it here justice in the program. It's an incredibly heartbreaking set of stories in the book alongside the chemistry. Is it sounds really unpleasant? Like, how do you sell that to customers? Why well, would anyone take yeah. this stuff? It turns you into this paranoid person who can't hold a job. Now, I understand that if once you're addicted, you're kind of you're in trouble. But how, how do you move from that to that to that world? I, yeah, I don't get and, it. And part that's because. Um, a lot of the people who are who are already involved in it are we're already doing some form of meth. The guy I learned this from, the guy who first told me about this, was a guy named Eric Barrera, great great fellow, uh, a, a former a marine who is now um, several years uh, sober and is now working as a, a um, uh, homeless outreach coordinator in Los Angeles. And he told me, we had this conversation uh, when I met him and he said, you know, I was a meth user for seven, eight years. And then all of a sudden one night I got a whole, and the meth changed. And he went insane. He, he, he's, he was always able to hold down a life more or less, you know, never with meth is it good, but it's always kind of more or less a life, right? Well, with this stuff, all of a sudden he was at his girlfriend's house and absolutely convinced that she had a man hidden in the bed in the in the mattress or then in the walls and he took a butcher knife began stabbing the mattress frantically then stabbing the walls out of his mind and he said he never once again felt the euphoria that he used to feel with the ephedrine meth euphoria was the ephedrine meth was like oh yeah let's party i'm on my game i want to meet everybody and jabber and jabber away all night long it was not that it was a sinister thing being alone with his pornography being uh, um uh you just kind of uh, a, a very, and he lost his job, lost his apartment, mom, dad, girlfriend, all his friends kick him out of their but, houses. And, and he's once that happens, but once that happens, why would you keep, do you keep taking it? Cause, cause because the chemical you know, compulsion. 
in, in, in his world is because he was just addicted to it. He couldn't, he told me, I, I, I never once again, after the meth changed, and he, he told me, the reason I got onto this was because he told me this happened in 2009. Well, I had already been working on a story that said meth was made, the federal was made illegal in 2008. So pr- actually in Los Angeles by 2009, they would be getting this, this meth, which all his buddies used to call weirdo meth. So this and, is and, one guy, though. This is one yes. guy. So, so what I end up saying is I, I began to think to myself, if this is happening here, I knew now that by 2020, 2019, 2020, that, um, that the meth, meth was everywhere. So it stood to reason that if it was the case with him, I would have to call people all across the country to find out, is this meth really, um, is, what, what are you seeing? You, the cop on the on the beat. You, the narcotics the officer. Agent. Emergency you, the, room. The, the emergency room doc. The, the the emergency room psychiatrist. Well, one one was extraordinarily helpful. Uh, Meg, Megan Shabbing in Columbus, uh, Ohio. But also recovery and treatment uh, counselors and some uh, recovering addicts. People who had been on this stuff. The truth is, I found only one woman, apart from Eric, only one other person who really had been able to recover from this stuff because this stuff so mangles the brain. I knew people, I met people who who actually almost lost the ability to speak. Um, absolutely, completely addicted. One, 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 one treatment counselor said, I knew a, a guy who had spent so much time outside during the cold looking for meth that he literally had a gangrenous hand and um, put him in the put him in the in the in the uh, in the hospital a few days. He 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 escapes with a gangrenous hand. He's most likely going to lose um, to find more meth. Why? Because it, it's the, 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 the hijacking, the complete hijacking of the brain that drugs of abuse uh, perform on, on, our, on human brains. And we don't give medical advice on this program, but it seems like a bad idea to, to take meth. And we're going to just we're gonna put that to the side. But I, I want to talk about the connection to the homeless population because sure. it's, it's – in the 1980s, this is one narrative, and I've told it myself many times, the 1980s – we closed a lot of psychiatric facilities in the United States. We used to take people who were schizophrenic, not because of drugs. They just were schizophrenic. And we locked them up and we gave them shock treatments and we gave them other types right. of drugs. We sedated them. And I found that somewhat dis- – well, I found it very disturbing actually and, and, and others people did as well. And we changed that and, and we basically said to – people who were severely mentally disabled through through psychiatric problems. We said, you're on your own. Uh, you you right. can live on the street because you're probably not going to be able to hold a job. We're going to tolerate that. Again, there's something almost uh, beautiful about it. We, we don't lock people up anymore. On the other hand, we kind of leave them alone and stay away from them because they scare us. Or, you know, It's the person talking to themselves on the street, screaming obscenities, um, often sometimes naked or nearly naked in, in the case of San Francisco. And we, we sort of say, well, you know, uh, everybody's different. And we don't, we don't even herd them into social service facilities and say, you know, we need you to, you need food, you need to come to the soup kitchen. They're on their own. They don't want to have an address. They live on the street. And you know, I've written about this. It's 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 a both tribute to our respect for another human being and a, to me a tragic failure to really connect to another human being that we sort of say you don't have a family or no one wants to talk to you. I'm just going to pretend you don't exist. I might give you a dollar, on you know, on the street, but that that's it. Uh, but you're saying it's something else now, and it's part of this tent right. phenomenon. So t- talk about that. Right, and 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 I think that this has changed significantly. I would say maybe since 2013, 14, which is when you begin to see the supplies of meth expand you know, geometrically almost um, with, with a widespread knowledge of how it's made and ma- hundreds and hundreds of labs now each with ton capacity, capacity to make a ton or more or whatever every time they cook. Um, what this ends up doing, because it turns people mentally ill, schizophrenic, paranoid, horrible hallucinations, you know, cheetahs coming out of the walls, the government inside my brain, People unable to speak, speaking to other to counselors that they may find uh, in numbers, you know, answering every question with a number, you know, in, incapable of basic, um, ba- basically living in a, in, a, in a regulated society. Those folks uh, end up 
basically um, with, with what looks to everybody like schizophrenia. In fact, that's a big problem right now is trying to figure out, is this person schizophrenic or is this person on meth? And, and therefore ought to be detoxed for several weeks, maybe even months. And then maybe we'll find out that the guy is like, Eric, like happened to Eric. Once he stopped using the new meth, he was fine. I were, he had some certain issues, but they were manageable and, and, and uh, all the bad stuff kind of, kind of uh, went away. And what this means is that all these folks have transitioned, many of these folks, I should say, have transitioned to the street, have become homeless because you cannot hold down a job or an apartment or even live with other people who aren't on meth. If, if you are wandering in the house at three in the morning, screaming about cheetahs coming out of the road, and if you have a knife, or, or anything that they become, you can't, excuse me, you cannot live with, with somebody like that. And there, as you said, we, we did not um, go the next step after, the, after closing the mental institutions by building community-based housing for folks. There would be, you know, three people to a house, four people to a house instead of 300 or 400 as the institute. And so we, we have abdicated that role. We left it, frankly, if you ask me, we, in a very childish way as a society, we decided, well, the police are going to handle that. Why? Because they have guns, they're on the job 24-7, and they're all over the city. So they're going to handle it. If, if it, a person starts to be, quote, antisocial in a way other than just living in their own world, right? And, and we're going to, by the way, the other part you talk about, which I've you know, read about and didn't really fully understand, is we've turned a lot of hospitals into uh, – I don't know what do, what do you call them, police jails because the people who come in are, are violent, can't yeah. be restrained. Uh, so, so all of a sudden, the medical community isn't curing or healing people necessarily. They're, they're doing more what we would call restraining, managing, from managing people with severe psychological and psychiatric disorders, but caused by meth. The other thing that that I find, having lived in Los Angeles, I'm, I'm from LA. Moved to Nashville recently for a bit, but um, my 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 upbringing is there. Is that frequently the conversation when it comes to homelessness is about the high cost of housing? Right. It's almost never about methamphetamine. Yet you could read entire newspaper stories for weeks, and they will never mention about homelessness, and they will never mention methamphetamine. What they will talk about is, and and it's it's without a doubt the housing costs in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle have have <laughs> risen frightfully. There's no doubt, but the but the idea that you're just going to put a meth, uh, a, a addled uh, person in housing without first months, most likely, of treatment and bringing that person back to some mental sanity is cr is crazy. The, the, the idea you're just going to put them in a house, they will destroy those houses. That's not a a, um, a way of dealing. What, what also they seems to me is that we are afraid. Um, overly afraid of, of 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 the stigma, which is very strong and, and and needs to be addressed. But you can't be willfully myopic. You cannot be willfully blind and think that you're doing anything about stigma because everybody knows it's 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 very very common. People know that this is a meth problem. The the huge encampments on Venice Beach, which were such a outrage, such a, 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 a horrible sore and festering sore in that, that community on Venice Beach in Los Angeles, was known as Methlehem. That's what they called it, Methlehem. People were on meth in those, those areas. And, and this is also, I should say, this new meth, this P2P meth coming in staggering, just staggering quantities out of Mexico has created homelessness in rural areas that never had them before. I talked to three separate areas, rural, eastern, West, uh, um, uh, West Virginia, well, four areas, uh, eastern Tennessee, rural Indiana, and central Oregon. In each place, there were really occasional homeless people, very rare. Now you've got enormous tent encampments. The tent is part of that story, too. Yeah, go ahead. So talk about that. Well, Tents and meth almost go together like hand in glove. Like this new meth is not a party drug, right? This new meth takes you into your brain and you're, you're very, you know, it's, it's, it's like you are uh, almost shattered mentally. Um, and the only place you can really reside is within your, 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 own, your own brain uh, all alone. Well, it's unlike, it's unlike meth, it's very much like opioids, which used to bring everybody into their own little world, you know. So why would why would you want to be in a tent encampment? 
Because, well, first of all, you want to be in a tent because the tent is where you can just be alone. You don't have to be around everybody else. But an encampment, particularly made up of many people who are using meth, is almost like, you know, I kind of look at it as like friends, the bar, and, and I'm sorry, and cheers rather than not friends, where everybody knows your name, where everybody kind of accepts you as a meth user, where there's this warmth in, in using meth that everyone's doing it together. You don't feel weird. You don't, you, you don't feel uh, like people look at you uh, strange. And so these encampments uh, are, are a direct result of that. First of all, they're a direct result of the sheer numbers of people. I th I'm really convinced that, that, that most of the people in those encampments are, are, are uh, damaged by methamphetamine, not that all homeless, that, uh, homeless does a difficult thing, and we ca call it one thing, we, there's all kinds of homelessness. There's the shredded safety net kind of homeless person who has a, uh, an operation that he needs and, and, uh, and, and uh, loses his job and can't afford a house and the operation. That's a very different person than the person who's uh, on a, in a tent encampment. That person probably has family, a garage on a sofa you can sleep on, ways of dealing, ways of coping with this uh, new world he finds himself in, and they don't tend to remain homeless very long. Whereas on meth, the folks who are on meth um, are, are, are homeless for quite a while. That's a totally different form of, 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 home, of homelessness. And so the tent, becomes the community, become, the, the tent encampments then become the, the community where, you know, the, the common denominator is drug use. Now, nowadays it could be you're using anything you can get your hands on. If it's crack, you use that. If it's alcohol, whatever, weed. But, but so for so many of those folks, meth is what brings them there. Meth is what keeps them there. And it's where they run. It gives them an outlet when they want to escape treatment. If they're in treatment, they can, they can leave. They run back to the tent encampment because there they feel kind of accepted for their, for, for their, for their meth use. And that is one and of the reasons for the massive growth and expansion. There are others, but the massive growth and expansion of these tent encampments is that simply folks are on meth and they need a place to be around all the other folks who are on meth. But how do you reconcile that with the fact that they're inside their own head? Why do they want to be around other people. Well, I mean, it math. comes and goes, you know, when you're, you, you, you want to be around people, you can have easy access to your dope, right? Particularly if you're a woman nowadays on the street, you probably don't pay very much from dope. It's given to you frequently, maybe for sex, maybe for all kinds of other things, but, but um, you want to be near the supply. You want to be near people who use it. And then of course you want to be able to go into your tent and your tent becomes this kind of little meth world. Um, I think that's, 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 uh, that's that's kind of common what's going on right right now all across all across the country. And these these large tent encampments, people view these tents as as benevolent things, as keeping people from the cold weather. And some and tents do have done that. That's clearly, we need to point that out. But frequently, I think now combined with meth, they are just simply enabling spaces uh, for folks with with. Um, horrible, horrible psychiatric problems now created by this, this staggeringly potent and, and prevalent methamphetamine that's coming out of the Mexican trafficking world. Um, you know, as you mentioned, it's a, the tent facilitates prostitution and other problems. We, I mean, we're going to leave unspecified how widespread this is. We obviously don't right. know. We don't have any clear measurements of it, but it, it, it's an aspect of this social phenomenon that I'd never heard of and had not thought about. But I want to take us in a different direction now. Sure. We're mainly talking about urban, we're talking about urban issues. But much of your book is about small town America. Sure. And as your as was your previous book. It, it's about towns in Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, used to have economic stability, used to have social stability, used to have community stability that's been lost. The phrase I think of is people are unmoored. They are, uh, they've lost a sense of self. They've lost a sense of mattering, of belonging. And I will, you know, I, I'm a generally a, a free trader, a hard, pretty hardcore free market person. We understand that economic change has costs uh, that can be disruptive to, to people's lives. Yeah, uh, my first sure. book, The Choice, was, was all about how small town America responded to the increased trade from Japan. And a lot of people left those towns and they found more opportunity elsewhere because trade enabled good things to happen in lots of other places. A lot of people left, moved to the city. The cities grew, small towns shrunk. Uh, we could debate whether, you know, what was lost or gained. But 
I think what's what's clear and what the cause of this we can we can talk about in a minute because I think we disagree about the the underlying cause. But you know, this is an issue that Chris Arnotti has has written about in his book Dignity and on the on the program. Mm-hmm. The, the the just disruption, uh, the severing of of ties that used to keep people together. This is why I mentioned at the beginning of the program the connection to the episode with Johan Hari or Narita Hertz. People are lost to some extent. Yeah. And I think you blame a lot of it on on capitalism. I don't. Uh, and you blame it somewhat on corporate greed, in the case of uh, the Purdue Pharmaceutical and the Sackler family. Make that case, and I'm going to give you an alternative, which I, th- I know you're somewhat sympathetic to because I read the book. But uh, I'm going to give a more – I'm going to put an emphasis on something else. But you go first. Talk about why you think this is a – a statement about capitalism and and uh, um, I, I just corporations. Think, you know, I, I just think we got away from and, and don't 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 confuse me with an expert on Adam Smith here on this show. Um, <laughs> much as I would like, to, I, I think one of the things I'm going to do after uh, this is all over is I'm read more. Um, uh, but but I think Adam Smith outlined it uh, well as, as I understand it in his um, oh what's the moral the the bony theory of moral moral sentiments. Moral. Yeah, uh, there the theory of moral well, sentiments. It, it, capitalism today has lost that in America. You know, it, it, it's, it, he viewed it as uh, essential, the moral moorings of, of capitalism, they, that you couldn't have a really, uh, if, if, if self-reliance, a, 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 a supremely beautiful idea in American culture, I can say, uh, becomes uh, crippling isolation, then, then we've lost something, even though we may have prosperity. You know, one of the, one of the uh, perfect examples, I think, of, of what's happened to our country is, is in the big box stores, primarily Walmart. You know, Walmart came in and destroyed a lot of mom and pop main streets, um, locally owned folks, people with lonely stores for sometimes generations. Um, I think this is the whole opioid problem is largely uh, has is rooted in part in in that those those stores before the owners would have been very, very careful who walked into their store. And if they knew someone was a shoplifter, they would come at them and they would get because they own the store. They were they those folks contributed to the local uh, middle school theater program and the local little league and the churches. And they held those communities together, though they, they were essential. The, Walmart comes in underprices all of those folks all of those folks are leaving begin to leave uh, maybe they also leave because a lot of those jobs depart i mean there's a lot of reasons but but walmart comes in and and walmart is turns itself into the biggest source for drug revenue in those communities because yeah, this is people, by the way people haven't read your book but it that sounds like a crazy statement to make so you, no it's you absolutely you, the truth I know, you gotta you gotta flesh it out just okay because those the people idea have no idea what you're talking about walmart particularly during the opioid epidemic was cutting back lee scott was cutting back the chairman uh brought in or he, he, head honcho for a long time was brought in and what they did was begin to cut back on 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 staff and you know uh, the self uh, self uh, charge well, those machines where you check yourself out all uh, that kind of stuff you could go an entire shopping trip to walmart and not see a walmart employee it happens all the all the time they became very well known in the drug world uh, locally for a place where you could rip that you could rip off with impunity and that's what they began to, people began to do and all i've heard in endless, endless ruses on how they did this. You go through the parking lot, you find a receipt, you go into Walmart, you steal the stuff yeah, that's think, on the receipt. Yeah, I think we talked about this in the last program, um, yeah. and it's in your first book, but it does come again into this book. But basically the sure. idea is that Walmart became an easy place to shoplift and help fund some of the use the drugs. Exactly, of, and so yeah. you had, you know, you, you, you did get those low prices, but you paid, paid another cost as a community, huge, uh, hugely absorbing the time of, of your police officers uh, and becoming really a place where everybody just knew you could rip off them. Yeah, there were maybe other t- uh, it was Lowe's or Kroger's you could rip, but nothing as easy, nothing with wh- the wide selection as, uh, as Walmart. And to me, this feels like uh, an example, a perfect example of our prizing low price and, and just kind of that, that, that kind of like easy access to stuff over over anything that really can't be valued but ha- is far more valuable, like 
like having locally owned stores where the people are going to be on the on the ball watching and therefore your drug market will never grow to the size that it will it has grown many times in small communities all across this all across this country because of it it's it, easy shopping it's also in Walmart it's also easy shoplifting yeah and so interesting point um i i'm not sure it's true. I, you know, Omar doesn't really like to be stolen from it. You point out that they cut back on some resources, then tried to use the police to monitor it, which is not very effective. I understand that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try a different approach. Yeah. I don't agree. I mean, I don't disagree that that morality is struggling in America. I don't I don't want to put that on capitalism's shoulders. I, I would certainly agree with you that, that a capitalism that is supported by moral people is going to be more effective and better than one that isn't. Uh, so there, I oh, think sure. we totally we totally agree. Yeah. But I think there's something else going on. You mentioned it in passing. Uh, you know, the other two books and, and authors I interviewed, again, they, they might mention in a paragraph or so. I, I think it deserves more attention. So let me try to lay that out and you can react to it. Sure. Um, somewhere in the 1970s, uh, marriage started to become uh, less um, a less healthy institution. Sure. I'll call it traditional marriage. The so-called nuclear family became less common. Many there's an enormous growth in parent in um, children raised in homes with only one parent. Uh, the divorce rate starts to rise quite dramatically in the in the in the 70s. The marriage rate starts to fall. They're two different things. They're related. Uh, so it's not just that. Uh, people who marry get divorced, people aren't marrying or they're not remarrying. And so we get into a situation, particularly for people with low levels of education. Uh, so all levels of education have had a drop in the marriage rate, but it's 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 quite extraordinarily larger. Uh, and the gap between – it's larger for low education levels. So, for example, I was looking at the data before the, our conversation. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, there may be – uh, women, I think I was looking at the chart, women 40 to 45, what proportions are married? Well, if you're highly educated, it might have been in those days, um, I think it was something like 80. And if you're not, if you've only gone to high school, it's 70 something. It's it's lower, but not much right. lower. Those rates have plummeted since then. The, the data I was looking at were for 2014. I'm sure it's even stronger now. 2014, half, only half of women 40 to 45 are married. Uh, who only went to high school or maybe dropped out of high school. I can't remember. But if you've gone to college, it, it fell and then it started to rise again. It's still lower than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. But it's it's enormous. It's, it's dramatically higher than low educated uh, Americans. Yeah. So Americans with less education are, are increasingly detached from an institution that evolved over time to civilize human beings and raise their children. You, it had a lot of negatives about it. Not going to defend it as a perfect institution. But the, the the interesting thing is that over the last 50 years, it has decayed. It has deteriorated. At the same time, religion has become less attractive, particularly in the last decade, to young people. So yeah. two places where people found a sense of meaning and community, either their local church, synagogue, or mosque, or their family, their nuclear family, their their children and their their spouse, those are increasingly less common. And I would suggest that we have not been able in America to find a way to cope with that social disruption. One way we cope with it is, I would argue, in fact, that the the me, self, the narcissistic part of our culture is actually not the cause of things, but more of the response. The drug usage that we're talking about in this episode and the rise in depression that Johan Hari talks about, these are coming from a desperate inadequate way to satisfy the basic human needs of, of belonging, of loving, of connecting. And you talk about yeah. it quite eloquently in your book. You know, if we don't smile at each other, touch each other, uh, unite yeah. with each other, and there's many, many ways to do that. And we're going to have to find those ways, I think, going forward, because yeah. without the traditional ones of marriage and community and religion, this alternative of say, a, a quick high on a Wednesday night is really yeah. not a good substitute. Now, you know, I, I would agree with all, everything you said, Russ. I, I, I don't see, um, you know, I see, uh, in fact, you know, 
it, it, that's one of the reasons I named the book The Least of Us. Uh, it, it's, it's a reference to where we need to return to, to caring for the least of us, but also maybe, you know, the, the least kind of, the smallest kind of um, gesture, you know, on the street, uh, a, a barbecue, uh, um, a getting outside saying hello to your neighbor. It's like the, it, these small things have been corroded uh, along with our interest in in the person who's eating from the trash or or the um, the grocery store clerk who may or may not have have um, uh, 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 health insurance and may have to with COVID uh, go to work, you know, it's it's these kinds of things that have been shredded. And within all that, if you ask me, um, is lies um, our economic system of capitalism, which has also shown the same um, shredding, if you ask me, uh, that, that and maybe it's part of capitalism to move in that direction, this kind of concentration of power, of enormous uh, wealth, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and just community power that we see now in many uh, corporations and, and stores and, and, and what have you, it seems to me to be kind of, it, it stands to reason that all of that would kind of be part of the same uh, of the same whole. And I, I think that is kind of what I'm trying to point out that we have allowed ourselves to think that big is better. If so long as the price is low, if the price is low, it doesn't matter how big stuff is. It doesn't matter how much economic power they wield in the, in the local or the regional or the national uh, marketplace for ideas or their own stuff. You know, to me, it feels like it's like we, we've got, gotten away from that. So that's one of the reasons or many reasons why I named the book The Least of Us. But it's that idea that we need to understand the power of being walking down Main Street and seeing the guy who fixed your shoes, um, you know, a year ago. Say, hey, how you doing? Um, be a part of a, of a community. A lot of that in, in and as you say, in, in, in small towns, that's been shredded. But if you ask me, a lot of that has been shredded, too in wealthy areas too i mean i, don't, I oh, see sure. these enormous houses and there are three people living in them you know yeah it, it seems to me like like capitalism can't help uh but be a reflection both a reflection and a cause of 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 of, of a lot of that particularly as we just since in the last 40 plus years have just said any merger that comes along you guys just merger up it's not not a problem i think we need to my own personal feeling is we're we're through with mergers. We've the, well, the stuff is so big right now. We, there's an we episode coming That's out. That's a whole other question. Of yeah, course. it's a whole other you thing. I mean. it, that's okay. <laughs> we, we we've got an episode coming out. It hasn't come out yet, but um, okay, Glenn fine. Weil. You can get to that later. No, but no. By the time yours comes out, it'll be okay. out with Glenn Weil okay. about what to do with large in, increases yeah. in corporate Great. power. I will listen to it avidly. But I, I think I think that's a little bit of a what I want to argue and and. I'd love to get your response. I, I want to say first, by the way, that you know I live in Jerusalem now, and, and yes, you do. this this beautiful haircut I got is was is from the barber who the hair salon that's the closest to my apartment. Uh, I walk by him every day on right. my way to the bus, and I'm really glad that I like the haircut because I enjoy saying hi to him. And I it, and and it would be weird that I would go to a place on the other side of town because it was you know ten shekels cheaper. I would feel. I, in fact, I even enjoy. I hope this doesn't scare listeners. I even enjoy maybe paying a little bit of a premium to go to my local, even when it might be less efficient, um, coffee shop or 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 um, or market. So yeah. I, I value all that. But I think it's a little bit of a red herring, because I think those connections, which are lovely, and I do, I do, I enjoy them. They're they're fine, and they add to the quality of life. I don't think they're deep and abiding in the way that that real community is. And just in defense of your argument, your book has a lot of fantastic examples of where what De Tocqueville called civil society, right. where people have come together in desperation to try to deal with some of these problems because they can't solve them with money. They can't solve them with government. They're solving them with time and devotion to the least of us. And I, I salute it. I, I think that's a huge part of the problem. I think, you know, I, I wrote a piece. Let me let me take it in this direction and then you can respond. Your analysis a little bit reminds me, I, I don't want to be unfair, but it reminds a little bit of the of the gun violence issue. A lot of people look at gun violence and they say, we got to stop the supply. Not a bad idea. You can debate whether it's constitutional or not. I, I, I'm worried about that. Many people aren't. That's fine. But I think it's strange that we don't look at why it becomes normal 
for a person to kill a bunch of strangers. And yeah. if we don't deal with that problem, we're fooling ourselves. And similarly, I think in this case, if people can't come together in family yeah. or in, in religious community, there'll be things we can come up with to make things better and to help the most desperate, the least among us. But I think we're going to have to look at this as a more systemic cultural problem and not just say a financial or economic problem you know i would i i, I don't agree with i don't disagree with any of that i agree with all it's, it's you're absolutely right it's a complicated thing nor would i say that they i mean i understand the the enormous power uh, of innovation and wealth creation that, that capitalism represents it's it's without it's indisputable um, I, I just see this as part of the mix. It's the one that I tend to, to highlight because I'm dealing with capitalists, you know, I'm dealing with drug traffickers, I'm dealing oh, with yeah. Walmart, I'm dealing with, you know, it's, yeah. it's where I see this coming down. Have, I would say the decline in, in marriage rates, rise in divorce, uh, unmarried uh, 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 children born out of wedlock. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 the rise of the box stores at the expense of mom and pop um, places uh, has all of that. You know, there's reasons for it, I, I know, but sure, it, it destroys stuff. It, the, 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 the basically, not, not entirely, but certainly the, 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 the gradual disappearance of community banks. Those, are, those community banks were huge in, in, the, in the development of a community. They knew what housing prices ought to be. They, they would do, do, donate money to the local um, uh, middle school uh, theater uh, uh, group, whereas the Bank of America, I don't think really, really does, you know. So you're getting, you, you're, you're getting this enormous trade off away from community sta stability from all these things that we've just mentioned. They're all part of, uh, all part of the mix. And then, yeah, you're right. I've never viewed drug addiction as, as uh, it's a cause of some of it for sure, but it's you know there's a sim the, it's really the symptom of of so much of what we have we've talked about, and of course we could continue talking about. It. And other authors you brought on mm -hmm. uh, your your podcast have have uh, have highlighted. I think that's that's completely legitimate. I just I'm dealing when you deal with drug trafficking, you are dealing with um, capitalists, right? Free yeah. market capitalists oh, yeah. are the most brutal. Oh, that's sport. true. That's true. And I, and I you know I've, as I suggested earlier. Uh, what capitalism is really good at is giving people what they want. And what I'm yeah. suggesting is, why is this what they want? It's something's wrong. Some, there's a hole somewhere, not you just know, in the arm, I would but argue in this the too, soul. Though. I would argue this. Fentanyl and meth, the, we basically now, or as I say in the book, we're now in the synthetic era of drugs, probably never to return, I would suspect. Right. Why? Because it, not because it, 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 it's what people in uh, drug users want. But rather, it's because it is what drug traffickers find most easy, risk-free, and profitable. That it's, it's it's entirely in their interest to go to the drug tra to the, go to the synthetic drugs, um, and 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 away from the real interests of people um, who use the drugs because they they can be mightily damaged, as we are seeing all across the country today. So let's close with the question that I think. we all want to think about, which is, you know, what, what, what might we do about this? One argument says this is a personal problem. You know, if you, if, you, if you struggle with addiction, you need to get help from your friends, from your family, from your community, and so on. Many of us are blessed not to have that issue with our own challenges. Uh, we're, we're, and we just say, well, that's eh, it's somebody else's problem. But as you point out, it's very destructive in many, many ways, besides just the, the tragedy of, of human uh, devastation. Is there anything we could do about it that is, especially given what you've just said, that, that the natural forces of trying to give people what they want have pushed this into a more efficient mode? It's, yeah. um, it's um, really scary. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. And when I think about it, I, I just... It, it, at times, I think, wow, you're just being such. What I'm about to say is so Pollyannish. It's so uh, naive, and it might be. It might be. I say this because who um, cares? Bring it on, <laughs> Sam. I'm a I'm a reporter who's been 34 years on the job. You're supposed to be all cynical and crusty <laughs> and all that, and I'm I'm I guess I'm not yet. Okay, good so for you. <laughs> we'll see. But I still believe that the when we are faced with enormous economic forces, like those in Mexico, but also 
those here in the United States that produce all kinds of addictive processes and substances and goods that are that are highly addictive and might well be considered as I think are considered almost as addictive as those drugs of abuse. Some differences, of course, we can talk about, but but we are facing a time when corporations behave like traffickers and traffickers behave like corporations. That's what I write write in the book. And what what is the our what must our response be then? Well, again, the book's title, the least of us seems to me to be the appropriate one, where we return to local focus on our neighbors, focus on our streets, focus, yes, on our churches, synagogues, mosques, what have you. Focus on our, our local business, patronize our local business. Get outside, for God's sake. So many times, go through these neighborhoods, rich and not. And I'm telling you, there's like nobody outside. There's nobody being part of a community, actively yeah. behaving in that way. You know. And we haven't we haven't um, talked about technology, but of course, well, that's, our cell phones help bring us see, into that. You know, you know what you, isolation what you and what you end up doing. What I realized during Dreamland, and of course, in this book, even more so, is that they are um, absolutely going. To, you know, we're, we are when, when you write about this topic, you're really writing about America. What we become as people, what we become as a country. It's a very, it's, I, real, I thought it was biting off this small little thing to chew, and it turned out to this enormous topic that you could not, could not uh, ig ignore. Anyway, I, I just, I think to me, that's kind of part of, uh, of this. So we need to focus on those human connections that we have done our best to ignore or shred or what have you, the community destruction that we have actively participated in sometimes, the, 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 the neighborhoods that, that get riven by, uh, you know, whatever, they, uh, a lot of different things, people indoors a lot, people without jobs, people without good jobs, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, I think one of the great things that may come out of COVID, of the few perhaps, is that we will find people commuting far less. And I'm sure, certainly hopeful that that's the case because those folks can then spend time at home in the places where they, you know, around other people. They don't have to spend an hour and a half, in the case of LA, uh, driving one way to work and then another hour and a half on the way back, you know, so three hours away from your neighbors. I mean, to me, it feels like all of that is part of where we go. In, and and, sure. and um, yes, I'm not a religious man. Um, I'm not a Christian. I do see, though, the power of this. I took the I took the title from the book of Matthew. I began reading the Bible during the during the, the writing of this book. And the, 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 the Matthew, G, Matthew's Jesus says that what you do for the least of my brethren, you do for me. To me, that, that made me start thinking of where we need to go as as a country. Is it an, a, a panacea? Of course not. There, one of the other things I realized is that we're looking for si simple, easy solutions to very, very, very complicated stuff. And I think, I think no, taking the small stuff, small, dinky, little steps, unnoticed, unheralded, non-sexy, non-splashy steps towards community rebuilding, everybody beginning to do that, they will have an effect. It had an, it's already had an effect. Look at those lawsuits prying billions of dollars away from drug companies to help small, rural, poor, devastated counties pay for what the opioid uh, uh, epidemic costs. Well, that is because all across America, I think, frankly, after Dreamland came out, this began, I certainly saw it after Dreamland it came out because before it was not happening, people come out of their shadows. They begin to go and tell their, their mayors and their state legislators and their chambers and their churches, hey, my son didn't die of a heart attack. He died because of this drug thing. And you begin to see a, a small steps taken by millions of Americans out of the shadows, giving power and encouragement to attorneys general and other lawyers to go after these companies, pry away billions of dollars. It's a remarkable thing that's taken place because each all across America, millions, I suggest, certainly hundreds of thousands of Americans came in small ways out of the shadows and began to make themselves heard. So to me, that feels like a good thing, a way forward in all this. Well, I don't, I don't, then I'm I just don't, a naive, not, crusty old reporter. No, no, I, I'm not sure I agree with that about the, about, I don't think it, you're a naive, crusty old reporter, but uh, I don't think you're naive at all. Any man who's been in, in uh, that town in, in Mexico <laughs> where they were growing the poppies um, is not naive anymore, but which I know you did for your first book. Um, I'm not sure that's the right 
policy approach uh, to go after the those drug profits, the pharmaceutical profits. I think that, that's a longer story. But the part I agree with you on, the part I, that I agree with you on is that the stories you tell in the book of small, those small steps that people take to feed a person who's on the street, to take them in when they're cold, to convert a church into a, a homeless shelter for people who are addicted to right. meth. Those Another are beautiful. Example. Yeah, those are beautiful. Um, I think we all can be inspired and should be inspired by them. And I think I think we'll all be better for it, not just the people who are the least of us, but as you point out in the book, the least of our own selves will um, be en ennobled by it. So I think... Um, there's much to be said there. We need more entrepreneurs in that in that in that space. Absolutely. But they're but they're stepping forward because there's a yeah. problem. No, I mean I think that's what I began to realize. You know, the story that really inspired me most and all that was the the story of Angie Odom, who who was the kind Incredible. of the thread throughout. And this woman, um, uh, you know, well, adopts the child of a of of a, a drug addicted prostitute who is in a vegetative state who she one time in her life promised she would help if she ever needed it. Um, I began thinking of those questions after hearing and fully reporting out the story of Angie Odom and how she then adopts this, this woman's child and then almost adopts the woman herself who is now in a, who's in a vegetative state, can't talk, can't really say anything, can't see, can't really feed herself. Um, to me, that is her story. The reason I had it in all six of the, uh, the, the six chapters and uh, all the parts of the book is because I thought this is the kind of thing. It's not policy. It's you're right. It's and, and it's not it's it's not a panacea, but it is something that that we might look to as we deal with these major forces that are arrayed against us. I don't have a better answer. Maybe that's the other thing I could say. Yeah, but it's something to aspire to is to help a fellow human being the way she did, and it's it right. made me cry. I think it's a it's an incredible story, and right. it's not the only one. They're, 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 it's a very powerful book. Um, Thank you so much. My guest today has been Sam Quinones. Sam, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, it's always been great. I love your podcast, and this has been a fantastic conversation. So appreciate it. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.